Hey guys, Mr. Ridgeway here. Uh, hope you guys are all doing well. Um, we are finally at our last, last lesson. Uh, we are finally in the Wacky Wild West. Um, so uh, we're gonna have some fun with this one. This is one of my favorite lessons that we do most, most of the year. Um, so log in with Pear Deck. Um, and for your warm up, the first part of it, I'd like you just to draw whatever comes to mind on Pear Deck when you think of the Wild West. Uh, once you do that, Okay, uh, again, have fun with this. Uh, you know, draw, draw to your heart's content uh, and then go on to the next slide and uh, let's deal with part two of our warm up. So we are almost done with our, um, with our reflections document. Um, we uh, only have um, really a couple parts left uh, and one of those parts uh, is one is this thing, and that is we need images for our writing technically. Uh, now they use the word images in this uh, critical thinking paper. Um, I'm just gonna again call it primary sources because that's what they are. Um, I want you to go to that primary sources folder in in our Schoology thing uh, in Plus stuff, and I want you to find uh, two images. Uh, in there again, image would be like a picture, um, artwork, okay, something like that. Uh, it could be a map um, from that time period that you chose, right? And then use them, okay, to uh, to help explain, okay, or, or use them, okay, to help explain why that image, each one, uh, is a symbolic example of the time chunk you chose, right? So, for example, let's say that you chose 1800 to 1850, uh, and you have a picture in there of um, a steamboat, right? Why would a steamboat be a symbolic example of the time chunk that you chose? Um, so what you're kind of making here, okay, is that you have the image plus a description of it, okay? You, again, you wanna explain what the image is, you wanna you know, say, oh, this is why it fits here, and this is why it's symbolic of this time period. E each one of those wants to be about a half a page, give or take. Okay, and again, don't forget to screenshot the image plus the citation for it into the document because we will um, do some do some stuff with that later. Okay, so hold on to that. Once you're done with it, though, we can actually get to our lesson, and uh, we got some fun stuff to do. Um, so the first thing is uh, there's two videos here that I'd like you to check out. Um, there, there's just links that you can uh, click both and watch them. Um, so please, uh, this is where we do a little bit of myth busting. What the West was like. Um, now you kind of already got a flavor for this with the um, the R-rated Oregon Trail, um, but there's some um, other things here. Uh, this is also uh, below. I give you a couple of interesting facts about cowboys that not a lot of people knew. Um, so uh, again, uh, check those out. They are uh, good that we get to do some myth busting on the West. So, anyways, after you check those out. Uh, we get to do a little bit of stuff with maps. Uh, and I'd like you to answer, okay, the three questions that are down at the very bottom for each scenario. Um, I'd like you to answer those on Pear Deck. And what you're gonna be utilizing here is this map that's up here in the top right. And it gives you three scenarios. In each scenario, you're ticking off different labels that are on this map. Uh, so I'll move my face here so we can see the entire thing. So on the first one, uh, we are looking at, if I look here, nope, wrong lesson. Um, ba -ba 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 Which one were we? Where were we? Oh, here we go. Um, major cities, railroad networks, and geographic features. So I'm gonna click railroad networks, okay? Uh, major cities and geologic features. And then I can change the time down here, and I can look at look at how that how that changes over time from 1860 to 1890. Uh, and the question I'd like you to answer, okay, for this one, is describe the geographic railroad change from 1860 to 1890. Not too hard. And then you do the exact same thing uh, with scenario two and scenario three. Uh, and you want to make sure that when you're answering this on Pear Deck, that you go ahead and just um, type all three answers into the same portion on the side over here, okay? Um, once you do that, okay, uh, you can move on and we'll um, do our actual mini lesson, which is on kind of the second phase of, uh, second step of manifest destiny. So 
Uh, our goal here is to describe what Americans' aims of Manifest Destiny are for after the Civil War, the rest of the continental U.S., um, and then uh, ultimately beyond it. Okay, uh, So uh, grab the notes page, and here's some of the questions we're going to be looking at. Uh, again, stuff like capitalism. Okay, uh, Is the U.S. Uh, a purely capitalist country. What? How do we define capitalism? It's going to be an important um, topic with Manifest Destiny. And again, it, it, it was Manifest Destiny always destiny, or could have choices and things gone differently? I don't know. Um, all right. So Manifest Destiny. Um, the, the quick short answer to the, is the United States a purely capitalist country is, is no. Um, nor has it ever been uh, because of stuff like mercantilism. So it, it, the, our, our first title here of this slide is Manifest Destiny with Help. And you before were looking at those railroad maps that seemed to just explode after the Civil War. And what's important to realize there is not, that is not just railroad companies just building and building and building and building and building. They're, they're doing it with a massive amount of help uh, and, and a whole lot of corruption um, because... Uh, it's that old word that keeps haunting us. Uh, it's mercantilism, Help, helping again. It's the government um, expanding its power through um, businesses, and in many cases, it's even vice versa. Um, so where we can probably see this best is in railroads, uh, as I, I've mentioned, and the railroad industry just explodes after the Civil War. And how, how are you know railroads able to, you know, generate the amount of cash they need to uh, basically you know build the transcontinental railroad for example and other and other things um, well uh, they're, they're able to do it because they get huge amounts of public money from tariffs um, they get they get it in the form of loans land grants uh, the the US government is more than happy to um, you know pr provide money for these. Uh, and again, private businesses are also more than happy to take that money uh, and, and expand. So, so it's, it's manifest destiny, but it's, but it's with a lot of help uh, and also then a lot of corruption. Uh, so what we start to see the rise of um, early on, uh, speaking of railroads, are uh, the first tycoons and railroad barons and this guy is a really really good case study of that his name is cornelius vanderbilt you might recognize the last name um he, he's also a uh, fun fact related to anderson cooper on cnn uh but that's a whole nother uh story uh he he's a um he he's born uh in new york uh to um a dutch family and he gets involved in new york in the steam uh steamship um, business. First of all, um, just actually driving his own, but then eventually starting his own line. And basically, he's a really, really good example of this kind of um, mercantilist, capitalist kind of expansion that happens at this time, because he uses the U.S. government to make himself immensely powerful. Uh, one way is that he uses courts um, and something called predatory pricing, uh, where he would um, not only go after his competition in court, uh, but also then do other just other devious business practices like cutting prices so low um, that he would just, you know, basically starve out his competition. Even though it would hurt him in the short run, uh, he, he would make it. Uh, eventually, what Vanderbilt realizes is that uh, the, the money that is truly to be made is in railroads. And so he kind of switches over to that. And he really becomes... The, the first tycoon of um, the railroad, one, one of the earliest tycoons of the railroad industry, and he just becomes filthy, stinking rich. Um, so, it, interesting guy. Uh, I'd like you to tell me, though, um, can you come up with an example on Pear Deck of a modern baron uh, that we have in the United States? So, think about like stuff that we use all the time now in today's economy, um, or at least it seems like everybody uses it. And who might be a baron of that? I, I'm curious to hear your answers. Um, now, the question that ultimately is happening with Manifest Destiny is, it's Manifest Destiny, but to what end? Um, and I can give you a couple of quick answers. Uh, for the domestic version of Manifest Destiny, domestic means home, okay? Uh, the point is a continental-spanning empire, 
Uh, and if you remember uh, the British, okay, and talking about mercantilism and, you know, use of resources and things like that, um, that is going to be basically what is going to happen then to the rest of the continental U.S. Um, the, the goal for the United States after the Civil War is to extract basically out of whatever they have as many resources that they can, uh, and they're going to then also develop that land uh, that they have. So one example of this is uh, the Homestead Act. And so um, how the Homestead Act worked is that settlers out in the West, if the, the, basically the government would give free land to these settlers uh, around 160 acres, uh, which is a huge amount of land, if they would agree to stay and improve it for a certain amount of time, normally it was five or six years, um, if, I, if memory serves. Um, but then also we see stuff like cattle ranching too, which increasingly are going to be supplying a ton of meat uh, to growing cities that are starting to become a thing. Um, we also see mining towns like gold and silver rushes. Um, it is the, the development of the West, quote unquote. Uh, we, we shouldn't discount this as not easy or frivolous work. It's very, very hard. It's very difficult. It's, it's a very tough way to kind of um, live. Uh, but the thing that we have to not forget uh, at all times is that this development is going to happen at the cost of Amerindians and uh, Native Americans uh, in terms of their land and their livelihoods. So that's kind of the, the picture for the U.S. Um, for overseas, though, uh, we get some kind of interesting developments in Manifest Destiny after the Civil War, and that is the U.S. is starting to think about, like, you know, overseas things even like, like what's the going to be the influence of the U S beyond just the, the continental United States. So they're starting to think about territory in the Pacific and in the Caribbean, they're thinking about trade with Asia and China in particular. Um, the idea of the U S being a naval power and possibly even like a naval power on two oceans, the Atlantic and the Pacific. Um, I'll give you one guy here as an example uh, of this, um, who's, you know, people who are kind of meditating on this idea of like manifest destiny overseas. And that guy right there is um, Secretary of State William Seward. He was the Secretary of State um, for Abraham Lincoln, then also for Andrew Johnson. Um, and what he did was he bought Alaska from Russia. And everybody at the time just laughs at him for it. They called him, they called it Seward's Folly because they're like, you're an idiot. You bought this from Russia, which Alaska was actually owned by Russia. Um, and they're like, there's nothing there. And then they find gold. And then later they find oil. And then nobody is laughing after that point. Um, Seward also, very interestingly, he's very ahead of his time in terms of what the U.S. is actually going to do. Um, he calls for the annexation of Hawaii, which the U.S. does. The annexation of the Philippines, which the U.S. pretty much does, uh, although we'll, we'll give it up eventually. Uh, and then also he calls for crea uh, creation of the Panama Canal, and all of which happened within uh, 30 years uh, of him calling for these things. So uh, he's a really good example um, of some Americans who are starting to think about this kind of like uh, idea of the U.S. having um, some kind of influence overseas. So your exit ticket for this, circle the face based on how well you think you could describe Americans' aims of manifest destiny uh, for the continental U.S. and beyond. You just drag your icon onto whatever face you want to, okay? Um, once you do that, um, the thing that I want to end on here uh, is something really, really important that needs more, way, way, way more time than we have credit to give it here, and that is... Uh, what is the experience for Great Plains Native Americans um, after the Civil War? And what was the U.S.'s approach to them? Um, right here, there is a text. And uh, you can skim it uh, if you'd like to. Uh, I, I think you should just read all of it because, again, it's you know, really important history. Um, and then this magnifying glass kind of shows you the big picture. Um, all I'd like you to do on Pear Deck... Uh, here after you've read this is to describe the approach that the U.S. had towards um, those Great Plains Native Americans after the Civil War. And there's some pretty terrible stuff in there. Um, 
something that I would encourage you to do, uh, just again, to be a aware um, human being who's able and crit, you know able to do you know stuff like critical thinking is look up I think it's called Adam Ruins Mount Rushmore um, and, and I can even toss in loss in here and if I get some time I'll make sure I do that um, if there, there's some pretty awful stuff that's gonna happen um, here uh, with with Native Americans and treatment by uh, the United States so check that out um, it's kind of a somber way to to end the semester um, but that is kind of the story of U.S. history is it, there's a there's a lot of um, promise and a lot of hope, but then there's also a lot of sadness, too. So um, other than that, this has been our uh, our first semester of Boosh. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope I'll see you guys soon. I hope you're staying healthy and uh, staying safe. Bye bye.